Hi, I'm Frankie Frayne, and I've been making movies since I was a kid. I've made four low-budget feature films of varying success, and I've been to film school. Twice. For better or worse, I've developed a science for completing feature-length projects on pocket change, and it has a lot to do with the kinds of conversations you'll hear on this podcast with teachers, friends, and artists. You don't have to pay 40 grand a year for bad advice. This is Discount Film School. Welcome back to Discount Film School. Uh, this is a podcast I've been doing for years now where uh, over the course of my time making movies and uh, I've done some animations of my own and writing, I've gotten to meet actors and teachers and all kinds of great people. Uh, and I've been interviewing them in audio form. But today I have somebody in our nice new Red Cow studio, Chrissy Felmuth. And uh, she has been a working animator for a decade? Yeah, 2008 was my first job. It, we've been active on YouTube now for a few years, especially with BoxMac and whatnot. And my relationship with Chrissy is probably one of the, like, it's easily in the top five, like, coolest things that happened out of uh, the experience of doing BoxMac, where she reached out, actually, with an art piece yeah. the, the, of us as noodles. And I was like, well, this is obviously not done by just anybody. This was done by somebody who does this, at least gets paid for this occasionally. So I looked into it and saw your, your filmography and uh, a lot of your other pieces and went down kind of a rabbit hole, and we became good friends and uh, this is the first time that we've actually gotten to finally meet up in the flesh. Yep. And so I'm taking the opportunity to interview you and learn everything about you that I can. Okay. Because um, I think that you're an incredible talent. Have you just always been artistic? Um, I mean, you want my whole beginning? Yeah. Uh, when I was in kindergarten, my mom, like we had an assignment to do uh, a charcoal piece of a rabbit. And the kindergarten teacher basically instructed us on how to do it which included shading and all that, but my mom thought I did that all by myself. So she thought I was an artistic genius. So she signed me up for art classes like every day of the week. I would go after school on weekends from kindergarten all the way up until college. Um, and when I was in about eighth grade, my family is from Cherry Hill in New Jersey, which is right across the river from Philadelphia. And there is a very, there was a very small animation uh, school there. It was like one floor of an office building and it was just like a couple of desks and you know, back then it wasn't computer stuff, it was all on paper. Cells. We weren't, we weren't even doing that. It was like just paper, pencils, colored pencils, like and the camera rig that you used oh, to wow. shoot it um, onto VHS tapes. And I remember like the first time, I thought I had made like an hour long movie. I spent like three weeks on the thing and it was like, three seconds. <laughs> and I was like, but what, there's all my work, where did it all go? Was it at least a luscious three seconds? Was it awesome? Like, to me, yes, yeah. at the time. I mean, I was in eighth grade, so it was super cool. That was my first foray into it. Were you saying you didn't have innate talent? I think a lot of it was learned, because mm. uh, I was, you know, I had no friends, I was a weirdo, uh, so art was my thing. Uh, I would, Come home, draw, weekends, draw, go to school, draw, just drawing, drawing, drawing all the time. And maybe you wouldn't have done that if you hadn't taken these classes? I, you know, I, there's no way for me to know, but yeah. I feel like I don't know that I would have been as drawn to it. It was like that for me with, with video editing. It was like I, I saw something where I was like, oh, it looks like you could maybe vid edit some video in your computer. Yeah. And my dad was like, all right, well, let's... Let's pursue that. And then had he not, I don't know what happens right. next. I guess when, you know, a kid wants to do football and you're like, yeah, sure. And then they do football and all of a sudden they're playing for the Broncos yeah. or whatever. But I feel like music, art, there are certain things that like I, I can't wrap my head around right. how you you couldn't at least be born with some aptitude. Like I see your work and yeah. I don't see somebody who's just doing a technically good job. I see somebody who's doing a creatively good job and that requires like you're using your brain. I think once there was the nurturing aspect of having the support and like, I guess, compliments of my family and my peers, um, I don't know that if I had never pursued it if I would still have that creative spark in me or not, but. So I feel like art's one of those things that like every kid, like art class is everybody's favorite class. Yeah. Like you're, you're encouraged to like yeah. play. Express yourself. Yeah, be expressive and play. A lot of kids at some point or another in their childhood are like, oh man, I'd like to draw when I grow up. I'd like to color when I grow up. Yeah. Or something like that. And few of them take it to like a, a place that could e even be thought of as professional. So when, is, when do you take that turn? Is it in the teen years that like you start getting yeah. really serious? 
I started uh, taking Saturday classes at the University of the Arts in Philadelphia to do animation and whatever other, like I took a video game course, which was how I learned Flash for the first mm -hmm. time. Uh, and uh, that was like, I'm definitely doing art when I grow up, I don't know what specifically, but you know, it's gonna be something. Like I initially wanted to be a comic book artist. And then uh, my teacher from one of the many art schools I went to uh, was like, yeah, you don't make money doing that. And I was like, oh, so I'll be an animator because you definitely make money doing that, right? Where the, where the cash is. Yeah. <laughs> no. I was gonna say, like, it, so, so it was a professional decision more than anything else. To be an animator, yeah. Because yeah. you, it, at that time, you would have been just as happy. Like, I would have been happy doing anything. If you're doing art, you're yeah. happy. Do you ever want to be a teacher? I have taught. It's so hard. You don't love it. Uh, I would love it if I had students that were driven. And they're not always. It, I do like. It's almost like babysitting. Summer, summer stuff yeah. and whatnot. Yeah. Um, and sometimes you get a kid who's like super into it, and that's always awesome. And that's the whole class. For yeah. You. Yeah. But uh, it, it's so hard to get especially like really young kids into it, you know, because they just are like, I don't want to be here. In those teen years, were you, was there some, anything in particular that was inspiring you? I was huge into Bone. Um, that was like my favorite series. Uh, I was also really big into manga at the time. Was there ever a point where you were like, where you saw something that was just low grade enough to make you go, oh yeah, I could totally do this. Like there, there's no reason I couldn't work professionally. Once I was through into like my college days, I was like, all, especially like all the people I was going to school with, you know, like I'm not creamy the crop of all of them or anything, but there's some of them in there that I'm just like, what the? Total crap. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. Why, if you can do it, I can do it, you know? Yeah. And it's weird because a lot of animators I know are fantastic animators, but illustration wise, like they're not that, Good. Mm. For animation, you can be really good at animating, but you won't be a character designer or, you know, background painter or anything like that. But you can be like a crap animator and also be an amazing storyboard artist. Right. So there's like so many spaces that can be filled by people that aren't necessarily talented in one way or another in, in the animation industry. So. So all right. So there's the point where you go, maybe there's money in animation. Maybe, yeah, maybe I thought I'll... for sure that was my. My what gave get you rich that? quick scheme. <laughs> what, gave, what gave you that impression? I have no idea. No, no clue. You're like, well, they need people to do it. They need people to do it, and it's TV. They have to be making money, yeah. right? Yeah. So, um, so, <laughs> what, so once you make that decision, you're like, right, animation. Then that's what I'm going to do. What happens next? I started looking at colleges. You know, um, I really wanted to be in New York so badly. Um, Why New York? Because you're at from the time, Jersey I was just enamored with it. Okay. Um, Did you go to New York a lot as a kid? As, as somebody from went Jersey? a few times because we weren't super far from it, but um, you know, it's just kind of a pain to get there. Yeah. Uh, we had family friends that lived there, so we went to go visit them a few times. Um, and just all the flashing lights and all the glam and glitz, I was like, oh, this is what I want. There's you something know? to like it being close and far. Like yeah, like I'm not like I'm far away, but I'm not so yeah. far away. I'm not going on the other side of the planet. Yeah, I'm not going to LA or anything. Yeah, right. And my dad probably hates this about me, but I'd gotten a full ride to University of the Arts in Philly, and I was like, I don't want to go there. Oh, wow. <laughs> I want to go to SVA so bad. You got the full ride based on your ability? Yeah, I got the presidential scholarship based wow. on my portfolio, but they also didn't want me to be an animator. They wanted me to be a fine arts person, and I was like, I don't want to do fine arts. because. For people who don't know, what's fine arts? Fine arts means you're a painter and, like, fine art, you know? Yeah. Oil yeah. painting, charcoals, all that Fru Fru Museum stuff. It's strange because there's like there's been like this strange crossover between like cartoons, graffiti art, and making that high end art lately. Um, so like you could be a cartoonist and be a fine artist as well. Um, but yeah, that wasn't really a thing at the time. And yeah. I, I just knew that I didn't want to be a fine artist because I knew yeah. I would literally never make money. So you love cartoons? Yeah, I love cartoons. What was the big inspiration there? I mean, I always grew up on like Nickelodeon and Nicktoons and... Wow. And that was all 2D. Yeah, that was long before 3D became a thing for television. Disney or not so much? No, Disney wasn't my bag. Yeah. What? It was too saccharine. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I liked Ren and Stimpy, Rocco's Modern Life, Ah, Real Monsters, like Animaniacs, even like the stuff that was borderline would occasionally have adult jokes in it that they slipped in. Anything that had like an edge or some callousness to it. Yeah. Like South Park, Simpsons. Yep. Um, I wasn't allowed to watch South Park, actually. Really? Yeah, my sister got me in trouble. It came I, out in 97, so you would have been... Um, I was in seventh grade. Right. I 
set the VCR to record it the night that it was premiering because I was like so excited about it. And then I came home from school the next day and I watched it and my sister like yelled up the stairs to my mom, Mom, Chrissy's watching that show with the flaming farts. Well, South Park and, and Ren and Stimpy anyway and Beavis and Butthead. They, they, I wasn't allowed to watch Beavis and Butthead either, but. Well, Beavis and Butthead was like the coming of the devil. Like that, like. Yeah, I mean, but South, it really, like you watch it now and it's kind of like. extremely tame. Yeah. But there was something about it at that time that like they, it was basically pornography. Yeah. Or it was basically snuff films. Yeah. Like, you can't watch that. Like, the, I don't, those boys are gonna, like, burn children and stuff. It, some, somehow, <laughs> exactly. like, I, I think it was, like, parents not actually watching the content and then being, like, stay far away from it. My girlfriend Sheila told me that her son's not yeah. allowed to watch it. <laughs> exactly. And MTV had really gotten this this reputation for being, like... Edgy. Yeah, it, well, it, it branded itself as yeah. edgy, so. But the, th those would all be thrown into the crude animation category. Yeah. Like, I see your stuff and I don't think it's, like, I... I the style doesn't look crude to me. Right. It looks like elegant. But a lot of your inspirations are crude. Yeah. So how do you negotiate that? I think it's more like the crude humor aspect of it, um, slight, being slightly more adult in nature, um, not necessarily having it look poorly done. Yeah. There's like a fine line between like, especially in animation of like making good animation look bad. Yes. Like I just had to do a project where that was my job and it was so hard. Because it was like, it's a very specific kind of bad. What was the project? It was Ballmasters, which is on, on Sundays at midnight. <laughs> Adult Swim? <laughs> Plug my show, yeah. yeah. The director is Christy Caracas, and he did Super Jail. He's got this very, like, specific, gritty style that he wants to achieve. But the only way you know what it is is, like, you read his mind. You have to just keep drawing it over and over and over again. Like, the first three weeks I was on that project, I was like, I'm going to get fired. I can't do this. I don't know why. But everybody was going through the same thing. Because my director was saying, follow the storyboards. So I would follow the storyboards. And then they'd be like, no, but you can't follow the storyboards exactly. You have to do it this way. And I'd be like, but, like, you're totally contradicting me. And I don't, like, understand how to do this anymore. Do you like the place you got to eventually? Yeah, I had to sit with my director three times and be like, look, please show me how to do this again. Like, I've, ne I've never had to do that, like, ask for help mm. three times. Wow. Uh, to try to figure out what I was doing wrong. But he was going for something so... So specific. Specific. Yeah. I was on the layout team, and it was all very specific in how things filled the frame, and I just didn't get it, because the storyboards we would get would be scribbles. Like, in an ideal world, he'd just animate the whole thing himself. Yes. He just doesn't have the manpower, so... No, like... that would take him, like... Eons. Yeah. Instead, the challenge is like somehow communicate this to everybody. Yeah. Um, Which it, is the biggest challenge as an animation director, I believe. And you've done that before with independent projects. So mm -hmm. we'll get to that. So uh, you end up going where for school? I went to SVA, moved to Manhattan, got myself a very tiny apartment for almost two grand a month. It was like 300 square feet. It was like this half. Wow. With a kitchen, a bath. The kitchen and the bathroom were the biggest parts of the apartment. It was like, I fit a single bed and then I had this much walking space and that was my bedroom. What was living in downtown Manhattan like? Um, I mean, it was what I had always wanted. Um, I lived on 21st Street between 1st and 2nd Avenue. I always had to walk really far because the east side of Manhattan has no trains. So I always had to walk to the west side to get wherever I was going, but I don't know, I was living the dream. And was the SVA experience a good one, bad yeah, one, mediocre? Like, I met a lot of really good people. Um, you get a four year liberal arts degree through that school? I got a Bachelor of Fine Arts, yeah. Oh, so you, so you do a BFA thesis at the end? Yeah, and my junior year I got my first job, so I took a oh, year right. off, and then I graduated a year later with a whole different group of people, so I got, it was even like slightly more beneficial because yeah. I got to meet more people. More collaborators. Yeah. Which I've always said is like the- It's like, really what you pay for when you go to art school. Totally, yeah. so it's about meeting like-minded people. So what was the job that you got junior year? <sighs> it was this show called Kappa Mikey. It was on Nickelodeon for two seasons. I worked on season two. It was about an American cartoon character that goes to Japan and lives with anime people. <laughs> it was so bad. Um, I actually, like somebody streamed it on Facebook a week or two ago. Sure, I was like, yeah. oh my God, I can't believe people are still watching this. And they're still like, sign the petition to bring Kappa, Mike, Kappa Mikey back. I'm so like, nobody wants to watch this. Somebody does. Oh, There's a petition. I mean, there's definitely fan art. We definitely had fans. Um, I don't know why, because it was so bad. And you were just on the animation team. I was a character designer, so yeah. it was character and prop design. But yeah, that was my first gig and I met so many people that I know and have helped me be so it was like a huge, what I do now. It was like a really important part of your whole journey. Oh, absolutely. I actually got called back to do 
another show that they were doing, which was Speed Racer, The Next Generation, which was another gem. Did that come out around the time the Wachowski Speed Racer movie yes. came out? Yeah. So they brought me back to do uh, character design for that. <laughs> it sucks so bad because when people talk about that show, they're like, the character designs were so bad. Uh, and I'm like, but th this is what I was told to do. They're not that <laughs> bad. But yeah, I worked that when I was doing my senior thesis. So I was like, constantly. That was my first, like, I have no time to do anything else but draw. Uh, and it was rough. So how did you get the that first gig? Like, I was an intern at this place called Animation Collective, which is defunct because uh, the guy who ran it was kind of a schemester. But um, I was working there and the producer came up to me one day because she saw that I knew how to do Flash because I had been I had taken that class and like they would give the interns like uh, shadow work to do. So we'd be adding shadows to animation that was already done. Um, and she was like, hey, do you want to take a test for character design? And I was like, yeah, sure, you know, whatever. And like I took it and she was like, hey, you have a job. And I was like, really? And I was like, ah. And they often tell you with your internships, like don't try to get a job there. The point isn't to get a job. Yeah, I mean, that um, wasn't why I was there either, yeah, but, but it she approached me and asked and I was like, hell yeah, you know. Can't say no. Would you agree that like, would it, is it good advice to, for people to not look for paid internships? Because it sort of muddies the point of the internship. You should always be a paid intern. You think so? I'm very against unpaid internships. Even if it's through your school? Mine was not, and it was also unpaid, so okay. I feel like you should always just be paid for the work that you do. Um, Which is something you gotta be super careful of in the arts. Yeah, unless you're like donating your time to somebody who's like making an independent film. Right. But if you're like working at a company that has money. That brings in revenue. Yeah, they should yeah. at least pay with something. And do you see a lot of talented people do pro bono stuff that they shouldn't do? Yes. Does that happen all the time? I've done it. Yeah. Because you're, you're so desperate. You're like, oh, maybe this I will I did lead a three something. minute animated short for $200. And it took me like three months. With but I needed that $200. And it's also like, oh, we have this pilot, we're gonna pitch it, and oh my God, if it gets picked up, you're like our first pick to get yeah. do this, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yeah, totally, this is great. I'll totally work on this show, and then nothing ever happens. So what would you advise people to do to avoid problems like that? Get like, a paid internship, unless you're donating your time to something like an independent film. So draw a hard line be between like, if Yeah, don't sell yourself short, but yeah. also, you know, don't be disagreeable. You know, it's setting a standard for everyone when you agree to do something for less money. Do you money. guys have a union or a guild? Not in New York, no. It's there is one in LA, but not in New York. Mm -hmm. they, there's always rumblings about it, but I can't the, the big it, problem is that like if you started one, then you would have to be able to not work because you'd have to be like, well, if you're not hiring union people, then I can't work for you. But the benefit would be that nobody would work unpaid. It would be more like setting a standard for people who do get paid for it. It'd end up like the Actors Guild, yeah. where there's tons of non-union actors right. and people just go with them. That's what New York is. New yeah. York is LA's unpaid actors guild. I see. Um, because we're cheaper. So you graduate from SVA. Yep. What happens next? I spend six to nine months unemployed because I thought I was hot shit in a champagne glass when I was not. Oh, because you thought you're like, I well, thought, like, I'm talented. I've, I've already worked two jobs. Like I'm guaranteed to get something else. Mm. Um, and I couldn't find anything. I worked at that job that was like $200. Uh, because I needed something. Yeah. I mean, I was getting unemployment, which was really helping me pay rent and stuff, but um, I was almost, I was two weeks away from moving back in with my mom uh, when I was just browsing Craigslist one day and somebody was looking for an animator and I applied. And I ended up working for this guy in Brooklyn who wanted to make viral YouTube videos, which never, they never went viral for obvious reasons, but. <laughs> This short's called uh, Agent Fat Kid, and it was about a fat kid who solves crimes by throwing up on people. I mean. <laughs> Agent Fat Kid. It's still on the internet, you can still find it. Um, there was only two episodes in that, and then we did some other stuff. I can't even remember what it was at this point, but I worked for him for like almost a year. It was like 2000. Uh, uh, this would be seven? 2010. Yeah. Um, YouTube was a little bit of a different place in 2010. Like I don't yeah. think they had their full monetization thing going no. yet. They had like, you could be a YouTube partner, yeah. Like you could apply to be a partner and then you could monetize videos maybe. 
And at that time, like, uh, they hadn't cracked down on copyright as much, so, like, everything was getting appealed as fair use, and, and at the algorithms for what got you more views were very different. It was, like, view count, I think, was very different at that time mm -hmm. versus minutes watched. Yeah. So, yeah, there was, like, kind of a gold rush of, like, well, maybe yeah, we can make... Yeah, let's make viral videos. We, yeah, we can make little tiny things, mm -hmm. and they'll be, you know, have a lot of views and get shared a lot of times yeah. and stuff. It was a really fun job because I basically got paid to do whatever the hell I wanted. It was, a, it was decent money. This guy yeah. was like really gonna go for it. Yep. He's like, I'm gonna spend some money and go viral. And I, didn't know, I have no idea where he got that money. There was some Madonna video where she's like writhing naked on a couch that's shaped like lips. And he had that couch. Really? Yeah. He probably has enough money that he like, he, he spins a few plates. He's like, well, I could, tr I could try to get Agent Fat Kid going. <laughs> And I, yeah. I got a couple of my other enterprises. Yeah. And some of them fail and some of them don't. But right. when the ones that succeed make him yet more money and then yeah. he can do that again. And, you know. Yeah. But Agent Fat Kid fell flat. It did. Right on its barfy face. It really did. The first episode was like, uh, he goes to a foie gras factory where they're like overfeeding the geese. And, you know, he's like, he's got to save the geese. So he gets on the conveyor belt where the geese are getting the millet pushed down their throats and he fills himself up to bursting and then he goes into the boss's office and throws up all over him and that's the end. How long were the episodes? Uh, I'd say between three and five minutes. Yeah. yeah. I feel like now there's a little bit more of a push to do small, short animation web series again. Yeah. I mean, Nick's doing it. Yeah. Cartoon Network is doing it. Disney right. to some degree. So I, I saw that uh, like there's a new web series called Star Wars Forces of Destiny and it's just like, they're three minutes and, and shorter. Wow. And they, they're, for the most part, they use the actual voice actors. Like Mark Hamill does Luke, and uh, Daisy Ridley does Ray, mm -hmm. and they just do like little snippets from this, all of the Star Wars films, but a scene that you didn't see. Yeah. So like the first time Yoda ever rode on Luke's back or something, <laughs> um, <laughs> and they're kind of cute. Yeah. Disney has more marketing data than I'm sure we could ever imagine. So right. I'm sure it was an informed decision. It was mm -hmm. like make those YouTube animations. Yeah, totally. And that seems like the kind of thing that would like like an animator in New York, a project like that could come to you mm -hmm. at, at any time. Yeah. Tell us about a few other like projects like uh, of that caliber that you that you've had. Um, I mean, I did a lot of ad work for a while. Um, back when flash banner ads were huge, mm. I animated the shit out of that. Wow. All the time. I worked for like United Music Group. I worked for Hendrix Gin. Like anytime you saw like a little banner ad, like what, like like yeah, it'd be like Eminem page. popping up and being like, "Hey guys, my new album's coming out. Here's when it comes out. Check it out. Click here." Is it a character design you did of Eminem, or is it like it's like you, a photo of him? You're animating him. Yeah. Okay. That that almost like like to me like by modern standards feels like porn or something like <laughs> little porn thing, <laughs> little porn gifts. Yeah. Uh, kinda. Yeah. Yeah. And that pay that paid like. Decent enough it that you paid could paid pretty well really? for what it was because um, it got a lot of eyeballs. Yeah, ads. It was paid? advertisements get so much money. Yeah, um, I did like a goldfish ad, and that got me like the thing about it is though is that you're only working the job for two weeks. You get paid an exorbitant amount of money, and then you're unemployed again. Yeah, so that's why I didn't really pursue. It. Uh, also, on top of the fact that I really disliked LA. I saw the people that were working in LA, even my successful friends. Mm -hmm. It was they would they would do really well for a minute. And then it was back to scariness yep. for a little while. And then it was like, oh, oh, good. I got a new gig. Yep. And then and it was just like, I can't live like that. I yeah. personally. Everybody dangles the freelance fish in front of my face. Mm. Like, oh, you don't have to work in the studio. You can go freelance and make so much money. I'm like, yeah, but then my second job is finding a job. Yeah, right. You know, and oh, what I if I don't find a job? So eventually you land at Titmouse? Yeah, actually, uh, after Agent Fat Kid and after the mm -hmm. Flash stuff, um, my Titmouse New York opened, and my buddy who helped me do like Willie in Fairyland, like for that. That was like your first ever, like, I'm just gonna make something for me. Yep. Willie in Fairyland? Yes. It was hard. It was more than I, more difficult than I expected it to be. Mm. Um, but he was like, oh, you know, Titmouse New York is hiring. You wanna work on Metalocalypse? And I was like, yeah, I wanna work on Metalocalypse. So, like, I took a test. I didn't hear anything for like two weeks, and I feel like he kind of just like prodded somebody over there and was like, look, man, just give her a job. Like, Come on. Titmouse is a, an animation company that's contracted frequently by... Adult Swim. Adult Swim. A lot of Adult Swim projects. And then w Son of Zorn eventually too. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we currently we have uh, Nico and the Sword of Light, which is for Amazon, and we have Goldie and Bear, which is for Disney Junior, and we just wrapped this thing called Hanazuki. So it's kind of interesting to think about the fact that like, if you watch a lot of animation from even multiple studios or multiple networks, 
even if they're wildly different styles, it's it, it it's very likely the same set of animators working on all yeah. these shows. Mm -hmm. To me, like I don't know. I guess I always assume like if you see two different styles, well, it must be two different teams. <laughs> but uh, not. A, like, I would never have a job. Yeah. Right. 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 <laughs> you, like the 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 best quality you can have as an animator is to be able to draw like somebody else. Like if you can't. Like that's what the entire part of taking a test is. Is like if you can't draw the way the show is, then you can't be on. Like you can't be part. Yeah, of this it. ain't about you and what and your style or yeah. your sensibilities. Yeah, this don't about... don't. I don't care what your style looks like. Do that when you're not working for me. When was the first time that you worked on a project where they were outsourcing some of the animation between keyframes to Korea? That was just Son of Zorn. That was the only one that we did in betweening with Korea. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, they're usually just cleanup, which is so unfortunate because uh, we used to have a cleanup department in house, and cleanup is like a great internship job. Um, but instead of calling these people interns, they called them cleanup artists, and they paid them a living wage, and they gave them health insurance, and they put them on the payroll and all this. So it's like their entry level job. And then um, this major uh, cartoon website, like it's almost like TMZ for cartoons, it's weird. But uh, they broke this article about how we're underpaying cleanup artists because in LA they would make X amount of money, but in New York they're making this amount of money. And, and But it was like, but you're now you're robbing all these people of this wonderful experience and the money they could be making because in LA if they paid cleanup artists that, that money would be against the guild's laws. Mm -hmm. Which is so unfair because like we're non-union people, and like I get it, maybe that's kind of like a scab job. But if they're not there, then it's they're work. sending it to Korea. Yeah, right, right, right. So now we send it to Korea because that was apparently so scandalous we couldn't do it anymore. Like in the interest of fairness to you, right? We'll just eliminate the cleanup You'll department. You'll go ahead and be unemployed. Yeah, yeah. That's, Thanks a lot. That's pretty. Messed, <laughs> that's pretty messed up. Tell us a little bit about the experience of you. You send your work to a faraway land where you don't speak the same language and stuff comes back. <laughs> like the stuff that would come back would be like so far beyond what you drew. And it almost felt like they didn't have a basic understanding of human anatomy half the time and things would just be. Tell us about the bicep. <laughs> That's what you really want to hear about. <laughs> okay, so there was, like this, there was this one shot where Zorn is standing there and he's like pointing at somebody and then his arm just goes down. Not a big deal. Like that's pretty standard, easy stuff. The his because he's a big muscular dude, like he's very defined. His bicep muscle, while his arm is going down, just like rotates all the way around his arm, and it does, it's just like, what planet do you yeah. live on that that happens? And like, if that's we, happening to your arm, then you need to see a physician. Because, like I know we don't speak the same language, but like you do have arms. Right? <laughs> yeah, I don't think we have different body parts. I mean, when I growing up, like uh, uh, kids of the '80s will remember, like most of their favorite cartoons had glaring weird errors yeah. pretty frequently. You think there could be a little bit more uh, quality assurance with, and there probably is. That didn't get through, obviously. No, I mean like we, we send it there, they send it back, and then we have to fix it. So if it comes back messed up. So there's an argument that outsourcing isn't necessarily cheaper. In my personal opinion, I don't find the value. You'd have to do some independent analysis that says yeah. like, well, the amount of time we spent cleaning up and right. whatnot. Right, I feel like the time spent sending it there, getting them to doing it, do it, sending it back, and having to fix it, I feel like it takes longer than it would if we had just done it. So then what about your independent stuff? So uh, you had done uh, Willie and Fairyland, mm -hmm. um, but then you've done a couple since then. So William Fairyland was my first one for Midsummer Night Tunes, which was the film festival it was made for. Um, and you know, a bunch of my friends were doing it, and. Uh, I decided to do it again the next year, and I made Not Without My Mustache, which is a short about a giant muscular guy whose mustache gets kidnapped. And the guy who was running it, like, I don't know what his deal was, but he kind of had a beef with me for some reason, and he basically wrote me out of it. Uh, he, he didn't put me in any of the promotional material, even though my film was screening, and then he screened my film alongside the student films that were playing that night. And I was like, but this isn't a student film. right? I don't know what happened. I tried to reconcile, but he, like I tried to be like, hey, you wanna like go get a beer or a coffee or something, like talk it out. And he was like, I'm not interested in any of that. And I was like, I, like, I literally don't know what I did. What did you do to piss this guy off? <laughs> it's the flat voice, right? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> He's like, Maybe it's that in my face, I don't well, know. Wanna get a beer. And then <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I'm good. He's like, no, I don't wanna get a beer with you. After that, I took 
quite a long hiatus. And no, well, it was like two years really, but I spent two years working on Beardo, Montana, which was like my baby. Uh, I worked so hard on that. It was thing. long. Yeah, that one was about five minutes long. Yeah. That was the longest one I ever made. But I premiered that at uh, Ladies Animated Short Screening, which was, it was the first year for that one, which my friend runs, um, which is just women's animation. What was that one about? Oh, that one was about, yeah, an 18th century fur trapper gets trapped in ice like Encino Man and uh, is discovered by a Canadian guy and he melts him from out of the ice with his bear. He rides a bear because uh, he's a mountain man. He also wears no clothes. I wanted it to kind of be a series, but um, in the episode that I made, uh, they go to a hockey game and Beardo accidentally smokes weed and then trips out and thinks that the hockey rink is the glacier he was frozen in. So he starts killing all the hockey play players, thinking that they're like ice demons. And w so what made that your baby? What made that like, oh, this is the, clearly the thing I gotta do? I mean, it was like, I really believed in it, you know? I really thought that if I made it, somebody would see it, and then they would make a show. But my failure to shop it around has also been to its own detriment. Of you have a hard time promoting yourself? Or you don't like to? I don't know, it's like, I, I don't have anybody that I know that I can sit down with and be like, look at this thing I made. And I also feel like it's not a kid's show, and I, I feel like Adult Swim gets just inundated with horrible Stuff. Adult shows. Yeah, because everybody thinks they can write an Adult Swim show. Yeah, because they think that their absurdist idea matches Aqua Teen or something like that. Yeah. yeah. But was that your, I know that you weren't the only animator on Beardo. I had my friends help me out, but. So you were animation director for once. I was director. I had my buddy do the backgrounds for me. I boarded it. I wrote it. I did animate it. I designed it. Um, but I did have a lot of help. Like those were the longest credits I had on any of my films. Were there were there shots that were fully animated by not you? There were a few, yeah. Yeah. Especially in the uh, hockey fight scenes. So how did you do that? Was that like um, was it like they were just a member of the animation team and it was their job to animate like you or? Yeah, I was like, I did the designs. Here's the designs. This is the storyboard. I need you to just do it. Do you find that challenging at all? Like, I mean, I. I was very selective with who I chose to help me out. You knew who to yeah. pick, yeah. I was like, please, God, you, yeah. please. <laughs> I need you. And then there's been the five second days at Titmouse. Yep. So what's that? So uh, once a year, Titmouse gives everybody a day of work to animate at least five seconds of whatever they want. Everybody always goes balls out and does um, like at least 30 seconds or more. Uh, some people do like five minute opuses and it's crazy. Why do they embrace it so much? I think it's a good outlet for everybody and also um, because it's such a, like they make it a big event in New York, LA. You're gonna get screened. Yeah, you're gonna get screened in New York and in LA and in Vancouver. A lot of people are gonna see it and like, because it's got the Titmouse name on it, like, you know, and it's, it's you. It could like, be a huge It is just you. Yeah. Like you can team up with other people that work at Titmouse and do it yourself, but like I've never do, done that because I'm like, I just want it to be me. Yeah. I want them to see that like this is what I can do. And it can be relatively short, so there's not a lot of pressure to like really blow it up. Yeah. Although people do yeah. sometimes. I was lucky enough to you let me voice the last two. Yep. The twenty eighteen and the twenty seventeen. And you you went fast. I mean, they're well animated. Yeah. I mean, they're up to your standard. And they I think you did this year's in like two days or something. Yeah. It was quick. Mm-hmm. Are you just getting real good at this at this point? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I am no, widely known as a very fast animator. Really? Yeah. Um, I think that's why I like have been able to keep a steady job for a long time yeah. because I'm quick. You're quick, which is almost more important than like the raw talent, like or sometimes. I it mean, depends. you need the base talent. Yeah. But the... Most projects, it's not enough time and not enough budget. So. I mean, I compare it to like cinematographers, yeah. where it's like, I I can see how a lot of productions would rather have somebody who's not quite as much a perfectionist mm -hmm. and can meet their days every single day. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, because the movie will get made that way. Exactly. You know, yeah. It's the um, difference between making it and not making yeah. it. Yeah. Do you consider yourself a perfectionist? No. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> See, because I'm the same way. I actually meet a lot of artists who either are actually hindered by perfectionism or claim to be. Yeah. Sometimes it's a it's an out. Mm -hmm. you know, I haven't done it yet because it won't be perfect yeah. type stuff, which is cowardly, I think. Um, but in the times that they actually are perfectionists and that's the reason they can't make progress, 
I think that's a real problem. Yeah, totally. Uh, I take shortcuts, and if I can't get it done in time, then that's just what it is. Once my films, like specifically my films, not my five second days, like once they were done, I was like, they're done, they're out of my brain. There's nothing I can do now, but I'm never watching them again. Right, right. <laughs> like, right. I don't ever want to see it, like, because it just hurts my feelings. <laughs> you mentioned the project that, the Adult Swim project that you're on right now. Well, that's just wrapped, actually. That just wrapped. Yeah. And so you won't know if there's another season. So you... um, We might know soon. And they you... usually get back to you pretty fast. Really? If it does well. Son of Zorn, we were always, like, sitting with our asses on the edges of the seats waiting for them to come back to us. Because we should have known by the night before, like, the night it aired for the premiere, like... That's really when they make a decision whether they're gonna uh, renew or not. Without calling out any particular ones, do you generally like the shows that you work on? Like, would you watch them? Like, if you weren't on them, I mean. Oh, if I wasn't on them? Yeah. Probably not. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, number one, I don't have cable. If you did I'm, I'm like the worst animator on the planet because I, like, I've gotten to the point where I just hate watching cartoons. Really? Yeah, I mean, like, modern stuff anyway. Like, I feel like everything on Nickelodeon, everything on Cartoon Network has the same face shit going on. They all have, like, the double bubble face with the very yeah. soft round mouths. Right. And occasionally they have lips. Like, I feel like SpongeBob is the only one that doesn't do that. And I love SpongeBob. I always love SpongeBob. It's, like, so rare for me to, like, see a promo for a new car cartoon that's coming out and being like, wow, those designs don't look like anything else I've ever seen. Everybody calls it the uh, Cal Arts face. Yeah. Because <laughs> everybody who comes out of Cal Arts draws that. Ah, okay. Yeah. But then they're going in LA and they're getting jobs because they could do that right out of the bat. Like It's like, oh, that'll do. Yeah. Like when I was a kid, I feel like not, most shows didn't look like each other. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. or at least the character designs were completely different. Yeah. But you're an animator who works in the industry that kind of pushes against it. Do you meet a lot of other people that push against uh, uh, this conventional stuff? I mean, in New York, like, we don't have that thing going on. Like, we just don't. It really is a Cali an, uh, an L.A. thing. It really is. Like, it's a lot of California studios that want that. Mm -hmm. Like, there's actually this guy who works for SpongeBob that's a friend of mine on Facebook. Um, and he got, like, a freelance job doing designs for a new show for Nickelodeon or Cartoon Network or whatever. And he showed, like, his original designs that he had done and, then, like, as, and, like, progressions from notes from the directors. And, it, like, he had these beautiful, <laughs> amazing, original, like, awesome looking designs and they just got more and more like same face Cal Arts look because that's just eventually that's just what they wanted mm. and it was just like that but it, you could have had something right I would think you would only go for that style if it was like gonna co cut costs or something maybe it can because everybody can maybe do I just feel like it's popular and I feel like networks don't want to take a risk so they're like kids like this Let's just stick with that. Yeah, it's just back to the low risk stuff. Yeah. You interface with LA commonly? Mm-hmm. Because a lot of times your directors are in LA. Yeah. And you've worked for short periods in LA physically? I did last year for a month. You loved it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, no. Too much traffic. Too much traffic. Well, I was Too also staying in Santa Clarita's and having to work in Hollywood, so my commute was misery. Yeah, I mean, well, like 10 miles is an hour. The weather was beautiful. I saw a lot of hookers. It was great. There's not a lot of culture. The buildings are too, yeah. new, too new. I walked by Klasky Xupo, where they made Rugrats and All Real Monsters and all oh, that's that. Cool. Yeah. But they're now defunct. So, cheesy question. Yeah. Um, if Chrissy in her 30s mm -hmm. could give Chrissy in her teens advice on her career, <laughs> yeah. What would you say? Be a lawyer. Really? Just go, don't do it at all. Go be a doctor. Go do something. You want to so, end this yeah. on that kind of a note? <laughs> <laughs> Look, man, like, anytime we have, like, tours come to work or, like, I have to, like, give encouraging words to college kids, I'm always, like, finding it so hard to do because I'm just, like... it's hard. It's so hard. It's, this is not, like, a... There's nothing uh, glamorous or glorious mm. about it at all. Yeah. It's a job. It's sucking it's life say you out of you. It's like, not to say you don't love what you do. You don't love the art. Yeah. But, you, but the career is... It's so difficult. It sucks the way careers suck. But it's, it's like double sucks because there's not a lot of work. Right. It's, but I'm, I mean, like, go to L.A. and maybe you'll kill it. Yeah. But in New York, there's like... It's, so, it's such a small community. So how does a young person decide if they really, really, really want to do this? I mean, if you really, really, really want to do it, do it but go to LA. <laughs> really? Yeah. New York is maybe not the place right now for animation. No, we just recently got some like law put into place about uh, 
getting tax breaks for animated shorts, well, not animated shorts, for animated series, but it only applies to series that are over 28, whatever the minimum is, 22 minutes? 22 minutes, yeah. yeah. Um, and so if you have a half hour show that's two 11 minute episodes, that doesn't count. Um, so it, a lot of the work does, that we do, especially for stuff like Adult Swim, does not count. So they don't get the tax break on that, and it's not, it's gonna be a slow burn of enticing people to come back to New York and bring the animation back. Because we used to have it. We used to have like a huge industry here, like that big like internet flash cartoon boom in New York was insanity. Right. And like people were like riding around in limos and hanging out with strippers and whatever, like Money was going crazy. It was just yeah. like make it rain everywhere, but then that just, it was the dot com burst and everything yeah. blew up. And then all of a sudden nobody had any money and there was no work. Prohibition era animation. <laughs> <laughs> Speakeasies, yeah, animation yeah. easies. Mm -hmm. um, so people can find you, Chrissy Felmuth, on YouTube, ChrissyFelmuth.com. Yep. You always describe the spelling of your last name as as if you were to fell down the stairs on crystal meth. Uh, right. Yeah. Fell meth. Yes, that's how you spell it. Yeah. <laughs> um, thanks for being honest. It's thanks been for a being pleasure. Candid. Chrissy Felmuth. <laughs>